Building habits can often be incredibly challenging. Personal development authors and influencers give us easy to understand and easy to digest advice. Things like focusing on one habit at a time, focusing on small wins, and keeping a calendar and checking it off every time we finish a habit. They talk about habits as if they were all the same, but I believe that there are two distinct approaches to building habits. And I believe that we need to understand the distinction between the two if we want our habits to stick long term. The first is how we can replace a bad habit with a good habit. And the second, completely different technique, is how we can build a good habit from scratch. Before we get into that, though, let's take a step back and understand how habits work. Also, all the resources that I'm about to mention in this video are linked down below. Some of those are affiliate links, which means that I'll get a small commission if you get any of the products, which is a cool, free way to support the channel. In his book, The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg describes what he calls the habit loop. And the habit loop has three parts, the cue, the routine, and the reward. And the cue is essentially what is it in our environments, what is it that reminds us to start a habit. The routine is the actual thing that we typically think of when we think of the habit. It's the actions that you're taking, it's the program that you're running. And then the reward is either physical, you know, do you let yourself eat a little bit of chocolate or, you know, watch a nice TV show after you do something good? Or it's emotional, you know, what emotional payoff are you getting after you follow the routine? So here's an example. You wake up and your gym bag is sitting at the base of your bed, it's all ready to go, that's your cue. You grab it, you grab your keys, you head out the door, get in your car, go to the gym, you crush a workout, and then once you've done that, once you've finished that routine of going to the gym, now you give yourself a reward. Maybe you go to your favorite smoothie place, get a smoothie or you know get a little bit of fast food or something, lower the windows, blast the music, and enjoy your drive home. This simple pattern creates a massive sense of joy after we've successfully completed a routine, and that in turn reinforces the likelihood that we're going to engage with a cue the next time we see it. So let's see how this simple pattern shows up in two distinct ways, whether or not we're building a new habit or replacing an old habit. When we're replacing a bad habit with a new good habit, I think it's key to understand two big things. First off, you can't just eliminate a bad habit. You can't just pit your willpower against a bad habit and say, I'm gonna stop doing that. You have way too much emotional fuel and memories and habits built up and your know, muscle memory built up around fulfilling a bad habit. Instead, you have to replace that habit with a new, good, useful, resourceful habit. And in order to do that, you don't have to just understand what that habit, what that routine is. That's easy enough and we don't even need to talk about it. Much more important is understanding, first off, what the cues are that kickstart your bad habit. And second off, what is the fuel or what is the reason, what is the reward that you're getting from fulfilling that habit? And usually with bad habits, it's nothing logical. It's more that we have a primal emotional need and that need is being satisfied in some kind of half half-hearted uh, shadow way by this bad habit. In order for us to successfully replace a habit though, the routine has to change, but the cue and the reward have to actually stay pretty close to the same. The closer you can get that cue and that reward to being the same as they were for the bad habit, as they are for the new habit, the easier the transition is gonna be. So here's a really simple example. I used to drink an insane amount of coffee like literally 15 cups a day. And I've cut it back to almost zero and in the last week or two, it's down to completely zero and I feel fine. But the way that I did that was I looked at my cue and my cue was wake up, look at the counter. You know, I see that my coffee pot's sitting there or rather my kettle and my French press and my container of coffee is sitting there. And then I make the cup, I drink it. And then the reward is tons of fast burning energy, right? So I have to have the same payoff. I have to have a feeling of energy from whatever I do. And the cue has to happen whenever I look at where I would normally look for coffee or whenever I you know, imi initially wake up because the cue is so fast upon waking up. So what I did is I always have just an empty glass of water sitting somewhere where I can immediately see it when I wake up, which reminds me, oh, okay, yeah, that's my morning routine. 
I grab it, I throw in a little bit of salt, a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of apple cider vinegar, which is hydrating and healthy, and I go drink it standing outside, looking out at the freshly rising sun. And I, you know, I'll do some stretches, I'll do some of those like old cheesy 50s side bends, and then I'm awake. And that energy is actually higher quality because I don't have a caffeine drop later. So the cue is the same, and the end result is actually better. And that means that this switch has been pretty easy. Another distinction around replacing bad habits I think that is hugely important is that oftentimes with bad habits, they happen around a cluster. They're kind of cooperating all to fulfill the same outcome, to give you the same reward. And gurus and productivity people will say that you should focus on one thing at a time, but in my own personal experience for bad habits specifically, it's actually been easier sometimes to drop an entire cluster of bad habits that are all supporting one another than it is to just drop one at a time. So in my own life, here's an example. Junk food, booze, and coffee, and porn as well, were all kind of one big network. And what they were was a tool for me to modulate my energy levels. Right, essentially the caffeine is obvious. It's there to help me wake up, pep up, and stay lively. But then those other three tools, you know, drinking, eating junk food, and jacking off, all served to remove the anxiety and the overstimulation from the caffeine and allow me to sleep and allow me to not feel the stress that the caffeine is literally pumping into my system. <laughs> so, you know, removing any one of those habits wouldn't have done the whole job. You know, if I remove coffee, from that equation, then all of a sudden I'm left just feeling absolutely devastated and down and low energy all the time. If I removed porn from it, then I would have the emotional anxiety of too much energy from the caffeine, even if I could get to sleep. And if I removed the junk food and booze, well then I would just be constantly overstimulated and never be able to get to sleep because I was drinking so much coffee. If you analyze your habits and you realize that you have a couple bad habits that all are around the same general emotional reward or around the same general reward period it can very often be the case that they actually act as cues for each other and it's easier to remove them all than to remove one and it might be counterintuitive but you might find that it's easier to take out all those habits at one time When creating a single habit, I think that that's when some of the more traditional habit advice comes into play. But I still have a couple distinctions that hopefully will help you make those habits stick faster. Because the creation of a new habit involves so much conscious energy to remember what the heck your cue is and what exactly the routine is and what reward you're supposed to be giving yourself, it makes a lot of sense then to only pick one habit to focus on because if you're scattering your brain and you have to remember 10 cues that are laying around your environment, all of which meant nothing to you yesterday, but today they mean that you have to do X, Y, and Z, you're just not gonna remember, right? So picking a single cue matters the most. Here are my three distinctions to help you make those single focused new habits stick. First off, you have to have a compelling reason why. You have to have a compelling because statement. You know, if you're picking up a habit because it seems like the coolest, most vogue new trend to be a stoic, to meditate, to, you know, train yourself with kettle, but whatever it is. If you're doing it for other reasons than something it's sincerely motivating, you're not gonna do it. You're gonna drop it. So you have to have an intense because reason why. You know, a statement where you can say, I am doing this because it's gonna make my life better in X, Y, and Z ways. And if you're at a loss for what sort of habits might matter to you and why they might matter, there's this guy, Brandon Bouchard, who has an amazing book, High Performance Habits. And in that book, he talks about how most high performers have six big buckets where they focus on building habits. Those are seeking clarity, generating energy, raising necessity, increasing productivity, developing influence, and demonstrating courage. And if you go through that, hopefully that'll be sort of a way for you to generate ideas to you know, figure out what your next single biggest new habit and highest leverage habit is. The second distinction is commit yourself ahead of time. You know, do things that make sure that you have to follow through on this habit. So, you know, buy the ticket to your beach holiday so you have to lose weight and get shredded. You know, buy the ticket to your amateur bodybuilding competition. 
you know, prepay a Spanish teacher to give you Spanish lessons for a year. Do things that make it so you can't back out no matter what. You know, in that moment when you want to fulfill a habit, it's very easy to just get started. But if you do things that pre-commit you, you're much more likely to stick with it when your emotions no longer feel so great and so optimistic. So you can even bet on yourself. There's a website, stick, S-T-I-C-K-K.com that I picked up from Tim Ferriss, of course. Um, but this website is one where you can essentially give a lump of money to a stranger. And if they see that you're not doing your habit, then they keep it. <laughs> and if you keep doing your habit, you get your money back. And so it's a way to gamble on yourself, which is pretty cool because it forces success. And my last distinction in how to build a new habit is that once you know it's super valuable for you, and once you've already bet on yourself and committed yourself, give yourself time. We have shiny object syndrome in like this personal development space where we're like, we're literally looking all over the place, looking for the newest best thing on how to be productive or be some superhuman. But the reality is if you gave yourself six months to a year to really lock in a single habit, it would absolutely transform that habit forever. You'd ingrain it so deeply that you'd be able to keep it pretty easily. So be patient. Because if it's really that valuable and if you've done a good job selecting the habit, it's worth six months or a year to build a habit. You know, in a decade, you could have 10 incredible life transforming habits. I hope the distinctions that I shared with you in this video help you to lock in your habits and really get them quicker than ever before. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, hit the subscribe button and the bell. And until next time, keep mastering your psychology and your physiology and keep moving forward.